Good evening, and welcome to The Lost Campfire, the virtual campfire where we will discuss the paranormal, the supernatural, the mysterious, and the bizarre. My name is McLean, Keeper of The Lost Campfire, and tonight I have some scary stories for you. Tonight, around the Lost Campfire, we will explore what exactly makes someone a credible eyewitness of the paranormal. Then, we will explore the strange case of a man who claims to have been abducted by a family of Sasquatch in the mid-1920s. Over the years, there have been countless people who claim to have had experiences with ghosts, extraterrestrials, cryptids, or other paranormal phenomena. While some skeptics dismiss these claims as hoaxes, or merely the product of overactive imaginations, there are many people who believe that the paranormal is a very real and significant part of our world, and that these witnesses are telling the truth. But how can we determine the credibility of those who claim to have witnessed the unexplained? Unfortunately, it is not as easy as one might think. It would be foolish and naive to automatically assume that everyone claiming to have witnessed the paranormal is telling the truth. The world of the mysterious and supernatural is undoubtedly filled with hoaxes and con artists looking for their 15 minutes of fame. But it would be just as foolish to dismiss all of these claims as made-up stories and nonsense. There have been many claims over the years with multiple witnesses or compelling video and photo evidence. And to automatically assume that anyone making these claims is a liar or delusional is a rather ignorant and cynical way to approach the subject. Unfortunately, there are very few ways we can actually tell if someone is being 100% truthful. Very few people have the time, money, or drive to do full-scale investigations into every single supposed claim of the supernatural. And polygraph tests are not as effective as many people believe they are. But, with all of that being said, there are many factors that should be considered when attempting to determine how credible an eyewitness may be. A major factor in this would have to be the reputation, social standing, and career of the witness in question. We first have to acknowledge that the general public often views believers and witnesses of the paranormal in rather low regard. Terms like liar, attention seeker, con artist, or even mentally ill are often used to describe those who come forward with their encounters and stories. The damage that can be done to a reputation after claiming to have seen a UFO or cryptid can be profound. One would assume that someone who holds a rather high social standing or high profile career would not make such outrageous claims without first knowing the severe repercussions that can come upon them. It would be, dare I say, crazy or masochistic for a person to lie about a paranormal encounter, knowing that the majority of the public would just assume they are not telling the truth and think less of them for it. And I would think that someone who holds a high reputation would be very hesitant to come forward 
unless they were damn well sure that they were telling the truth. And they were ready to face the hurricane of naysayers and skeptics that would inevitably question their integrity and sanity. The same case can be made for those who hold high-profile careers. People often spend years upon years to get into high positions at their jobs, either through intense schooling or climbing corporate ladders. If someone were to make a claim that would cause others to question their credibility, their intelligence, or their sanity, that could possibly undo the years of hard work they have done in a matter of minutes. Imagine if you were a staunch skeptic in all things supernatural. Now imagine the principal of your child's school began telling stories of having seen a ghost or a lake monster. Many people who hold the mindset of a skeptic would at the very least raise a few questions as to whether or not this person should hold that position. Even if that person was being honest, there are just many others who would not believe them, and that could possibly ruin their entire career. But it should also be noted that many people in high-profile jobs often have a skeptical and analytical mind to begin with. For example, a police officer or a lawyer may have to determine what is fact and what is fiction on a near daily basis. One would assume that someone in those positions must have ruled out all rational explanations before even considering going public with their stories of the paranormal. Of course, in these situations, we also have to weigh the risk versus the reward. Is the payoff for making false claims about the paranormal worth destroying your reputation or possibly losing a job you have been working hard to get? I honestly do not think so. I think the fact that people in these positions would even dare come out lends quite a bit of credibility to their claims. The amount they have to gain from lying does not nearly equal out to what they are more likely going to lose. Keep in mind, these factors cannot be used to 100% determine if someone is telling the truth. I just doubt someone would knowingly bet their reputation and income on a lie. Of course, not everyone who comes forward with an encounter of the unknown has a high-profile job or elevated social standing. These are just average citizens who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when they saw something they can't explain. These people may not have reputations to uphold. The consequences of them lying would not be as severe as, say, a school teacher or a judge. But just because these people are not members of high society does not mean their stories should be overlooked. If the average Joe were to get caught in a lie regarding Bigfoot or a ghost, they would probably not fall into financial ruin or become a social pariah. That would mean they have little to no reason to make up fantastical stories to get their name and picture in the local paper. But just because these people may not have much to lose does not mean they are more prone to lie and fabricate stories. In fact, them being regular people makes me think they may be more forthcoming and honest. When I think of a regular person, I rarely make an association to a strong belief in the paranormal. 
I would think that middle to lower class America has many other things to worry about outside of, say, the UFO phenomena. Are their children doing well in school? Will their next paycheck be enough to cover their bills and mortgage? Are they going to need to get a second job before the bank forecloses on them? The list of worries that plague the typical North American household can go on forever. Subjects like the paranormal and supernatural do not seem to be the type of thing that would be top priority in the lives of regular citizens. It may be a passing interest, but not something that would take priority over children and income. So, when an average family goes on a weekend camping trip or a hike through a national park, and they see or hear something they cannot rationally explain, I doubt they were influenced by confirmation bias due to an obsession with the paranormal. To put it simply, people like this have much bigger fish to fry than the existence of Sasquatch. Now, some might say that the struggle of the middle and lower class is the perfect reason to make up a paranormal experience. If the story garners enough attention, it may draw in television and film crews who may want to document the phenomena. Though, there is the possibility of that sort of payout happening. The odds are really against you. People have been claiming to have encounters with the paranormal for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But the ones that have become well-known cases that are featured in movie and television can be narrowed down to maybe a few dozen. The amount of time and effort it would take faking an encounter for the low chance of it becoming a highly documented case doesn't seem worth it. So, I have my doubts that the Joneses down the street are spending their waking hours fabricating a complex story of a cryptid encounter, or that their home is haunted. As I stated before, it is risk versus reward. In these instances, the risk may be minimal, but the reward is nearly non-existent. Finally, this brings us to whom I would consider to be the most credible witness of the paranormal, hunters and outdoorsmen. Generally speaking, outdoorsmen and hunters spend considerable amounts of time exploring the most remote and isolated areas, areas that your average person would never go, areas where unknown creatures may call home. This near constant exploration of hidden areas may greatly increase the odds of encountering an unknown creature. Furthermore, hunters spend many years honing their observational skills and becoming familiar with the local wildlife. Outdoorsmen lead a life that is closer to nature than most other people. This lifestyle requires them to be attentive, detail-oriented, and observant. This heightened sense of awareness enables them to detect minor fluctuations in their surroundings and detect any strange sounds or movements that may not be familiar to others. This would also rule out the chances of them misidentifying natural wildlife for a cryptid. Hunters would be familiar with the sights, sounds, and smells of the average fauna inhabiting their location. So, when an outdoorsman tells a story of seeing something they cannot rationally explain, they may be onto something. We should also cover the idea of confirmation bias. The idea that those who go out looking for the paranormal 
will unknowingly attribute all sights and sounds to the paranormal. I think that most hunters out in the wilderness are not actively searching for cryptids. They tend to just be on the lookout for the game they are hunting, or dangerous known animals in the area. Of course, it is impossible for me to determine the interests and beliefs of all outdoorsmen and hunters. I just think the odds are somewhat low for the phenomena of confirmation bias to affect the average hunter. All of these factors combined would lead one to believe that if there is something unnatural or unusual going on around an outdoorsman, they would be able to pick up on it rather quickly. However, I do think it is still worth pointing out that the odds of encountering something supernatural is still relatively low. There are plenty of hunters and outdoorsmen who have spent countless nights out in the woods who have never come into contact with anything paranormal or strange. I just believe the few who have are more likely to be telling the truth based on their lifestyle and isolation, combined with their keen observational skills, situational awareness, and knowledge of wilderness and wildlife. These traits seem to make them uniquely suited for identifying unusual and unfamiliar activities and creatures. So the next time you are around an outdoorsman and they are telling a tale of seeing something that they just could not explain, you should lend them your ear. There's a pretty good chance they are telling the truth. But maybe we shouldn't be too hasty. I think we should look at this from the viewpoint of a skeptic. I certainly cannot blame those who are dismissive of eyewitness encounters. After all, anyone, regardless of their job, social standing, or knowledge of the outdoors, has the capability to lie. And unfortunately, the world of the paranormal has been wrought with liars and hoaxes. Of course, to truly determine whether or not someone is a credible witness would require a legitimate investigation into their claims. Multiple trips to the supposed location would need to be made. Evidence would need to be collected. Witnesses would need to be interviewed. Stories would need to be heavily scrutinized for consistency and exaggeration. But just because we should be somewhat wary does not mean we should not listen to eyewitness encounters with an open mind. It would be rather cynical and unfair to automatically assume someone is mentally unstable or a liar just because they think they've seen something paranormal. In conclusion, I truly believe that anyone could possibly encounter a cryptid, ghost, UFO, or any of the other mysterious phenomena that has been reported over the years. You never know when you could be the next person driving down a lonely road at night, when something you never thought existed crosses your path and turns your world upside down. The Lost Campfire will continue after this quick message. Attention all campers, are you fascinated by the unexplainable and mysterious? Have you ever experienced something supernatural that you just can't shake off? Then I want to hear from you. The Lost Campfire is on the lookout for listeners to share their spine-tingling encounters with paranormal phenomena. Whether it's a ghostly apparition, a cryptid encounter, or a UFO sighting, I want to hear your story. 
Not only will your story be featured on The Lost Campfire, but it will also help us unravel some of the most perplexing mysteries of the paranormal. Your experience may be the missing link to help us understand the unknown. So don't be shy. Share your tale with us and help us continue our quest to uncover the truth about the supernatural. Together, we can explore the unexplainable and attempt to solve some of the most puzzling mysteries of all time. Send in your written or recorded story to the Lost Campfire at gmail.com today to be featured in a future episode. I cannot wait to hear what you have experienced and to share it with other paranormal enthusiasts. Now, let's get back to the campfire for our second story. In our day and age, you would be hard-pressed to find anyone who is unaware of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Over the past few years, the large, bipedal ape that calls North America its home has become a cultural phenomena. People have dedicated their lives in search of Sasquatch, and there are countless movies, TV shows, podcasts, and YouTube channels that are entirely centered around this hairy legend. And it is pretty easy to understand why. There is just something tantalizing about the concept of this wood ape living in the wilds of Canada and the United States. Humans love a good mystery, especially when that mystery rears its big, furry head every now and then to keep us on our toes. With all of that being said, it is almost hard to believe that there was a time when most people were completely unaware of such a popular and well-known legend. The most famous piece of Bigfoot evidence, the Patterson-Gimlin film, has only been around since 1967, and the term Bigfoot itself was only coined in 1958. Before that, the idea of Sasquatch or the Wild Man was simply native folklore. Sure, every now and then, a miner or prospector may claim to have seen a wild man, but those kinds of stories would rarely reach the general public. But once in a while, a witness has come forward to share their tale with a journalist, and an article is written. And the funny thing about people coming forward with their stories of such weird events is it often causes others who have had similar encounters to come forward with their stories as well. And that is exactly what happened in 1957 when a man named Albert Ostman started seeing newspaper articles about hunters, trappers, and prospectors encountering the North American wild man. After reading that so many people had seen this creature, Ostman reached out to his local newspaper with an unbelievable tale of being abducted and held captive by a family of Sasquatch for six days, over thirty years prior. But I suppose we should start from the very beginning. It was the summer of 1924, and Canadian woodsman Albert Ostman was working for a construction company in the province of British Columbia. He had been working for this company for just over a year, and he had decided he was overdue for a short vacation. And seeing as he was in B.C., a province known for its gold deposits, he thought he would do some prospecting while he was at it. 
Ostman had heard of a supposed forgotten gold mine in the Toba Inlet, and figured that would be the perfect place to start looking, and to spend some nights sleeping out under the stars. To get to the Toba Inlet, Ostman hired a native guide to help lead the way. In their time traveling together, Ostman and the guide would speak of the area and the gold mines. The native would tell stories of white men who had struck it rich, and others who had never found anything. He also told stories of men who had gone into those mountains and were never seen again. But Albert knew of the dangers and risks of prospecting. He figured those men had died of exposure, or possibly run-ins with bears or mountain lions. However, the native guide corrected him. Those men had not been attacked by bears or big cats. Those men had been attacked by the Sasquatch. Ostman had never heard the term Sasquatch before, so he inquired what such an animal could be. But once again, the native guide corrected him. The Sasquatch was no animal. The Sasquatch was a giant man, sometimes standing over eight feet tall. They were covered in thick hair. They smell terrible, and leave behind gigantic footprints, and they were very aggressive towards humans. But upon hearing these scary stories of huge hairy men, Ostman laughed it off. He told the native guide that he did not believe in these silly Indian legends of humongous hairy mountain monsters. There was a reasonable and logical explanation for the missing prospectors, and that such creatures simply do not exist. They may have at one time in the past, but there is no way our modern times of 1924 could such a thing live undetected. But the native guide warned Ostman, though there may not be many Sasquatch left, they still inhabit those mountains, and should not be taken lightly. It wasn't long until the native guide was able to bring Albert to the Toba Inlet. Osman told the guide to return in three weeks, so he could guide him back home. They agreed, shook hands, and then parted ways. Albert was off to spend the next several weeks alone in the mountains, in hopes of finding gold. But if he didn't, he was perfectly content with just having a nice vacation, living off the land, and enjoying the majesty of nature. He packed a sleeping bag, but no tent. Since it was summer, and the weather was quite warm, he figured he could just sleep out under the stars, and a fire would be more than enough to keep him comfortable throughout the night. Albert also packed a Winchester rifle and boxes of bullets for hunting, a pickaxe for prospecting, a knife, and some other basic survival provisions, such as food, cooking equipment, matches, and the like. Albert had also brought along a few packs of snuff. Snuff being ground-up tobacco leaves that one could snort through their nose or put in their lip to chew on in order to get their nicotine fix. Ostman spent the next several days ascending the mountain. He would hike for hours while looking for any mineral deposits. Then in the evenings, he would set up camp, dig for water, and then enjoy his dinner by the fire. Thankfully, after a few days, Albert was able to find the perfect spot to set up a permanent camp. It was near a rock deposit 
where he could prospect, and there was a freshwater spring close by, which would make collecting water a much easier task. Ostman was able to set up a nice bedding area from the surrounding brush and made a fire pit for his cooking. He had also hung his pack from a nearby tree to prevent bears and other vermin from stealing his precious food in the night. From a fellow camper, I have to say, this is a pretty sweet setup. But as soon as Albert started using this area for his camp, strange things started happening at night. One morning, Albert had noticed that while he slept, something has gone through his camp and rummaged through his things. Thankfully, after taking inventory, he saw that nothing was actually missing, but this was a tad concerning. Of course, he thought it was probably just a coyote or porcupine looking for something to eat. Nothing to really worry about. However, the following night, Albert did decide to sleep with his gun loaded by his side, just in case his nightly visitor came back looking for another free meal. Worst case scenario, he is awoken by this critter, and he fires around and scares it off for good. Best case scenario, he kills whatever this is, and now he has some fresh meat. But upon waking up the following morning, Albert saw that things had escalated. His pack that had been hanging from the tree had been completely turned upside down, emptied, and a pack of prunes and pancake mix had been stolen. Obviously, this had not been done by a porcupine or coyote, but perhaps it was a bear. Unlikely. Bears tend to shred packs with their claws when scavenging for food. Whatever had done this was big enough to reach the bag, and was nimble enough to empty the pack without destroying it. Albert began to look for tracks, hoping that he could identify who this nighttime thief was. But he was unable to pick up on any definitive sign or marker. The following day, Albert decided to stay close to camp, just in case whatever this was decided to come back during daytime hours, but nothing ever appeared. But once again waking up, his camp had been disturbed in a similar fashion for the third night in a row. The next evening, Ostman was determined to catch this thing in the act. He packed his shoes, knife, and rifle into his sleeping bag, and then squeezed himself in, fully dressed. He wanted to be prepared and ready for action, as soon as whatever this was undoubtedly returned. Albert planned on staying awake all night, but the long day had gotten the better of him, and he eventually dozed off. Ostman was unsure how long he had been asleep for exactly, before he was eventually jostled awake. Something big and strong had grabbed Ostman in his sleeping bag with all of his things, and began carrying him away. At first, Albert thought a man had grabbed him, and thrown him over horseback. But as this thing was carrying him, he noticed that the footfalls were not the rhythmic pattern of a four-legged horse. It was a very distinct two-foot gait. Albert began to panic and struggle, but whatever had hold of him was far too strong for him to break free from its grip. He tried to reach for his knife, so he could cut his way out of the bag, but he was in such an awkward position, he was unable to reach the blade. Thankfully, he was able to get a hold of his rifle, but once again, due to the awkward positioning, 
he was unable to safely take a shot. But this did not stop him from holding on to that gun for dear life. Albert was also able to feel and hear the sound of his pack of provisions banging against his body. The creature had not only abducted Albert, but had also taken his things as well. The being that had a hold of the man carried him for hours on end. Ostman claims that while he was being carried, he could hear and feel this creature taking deep, heavy breaths, and would cough on occasion. And during this time of being mobilized, Ostman was able to reason that the creature that was abducting him must be one of the Sasquatch mountain monsters that the native guide had told him about. This realization deeply concerned Ostman. He remembered the stories of men never being seen again. The stories about how aggressive these giants were towards people. Albert knew that wherever they were headed, it was not going to end well for him. After about three hours of travel time, the abductor finally stopped walking, and then dropped both Albert and his pack to the ground. Ostman was far too scared to poke his head out of his sleeping bag to see where he was or what was going on, but he heard heavy footsteps walking away from him, followed by cryptic chattering and grunting noises. He thought maybe this was people talking in a language he did not understand. After a few more moments of cowering in the sleeping bag, Albert decided it was finally time to come out and face his abductors. But upon leaving the bag, he noticed that it was still nighttime and far too dark for him to actually see anything. But he could still hear movement and chattering all around him. Ostman was somewhat relieved, though. He figured that if these Sasquatch monsters wanted to harm him, they would have done it by now. So perhaps he was in somewhat of a safe environment. As dawn finally broke, Albert was able to see who his captors were, and he could not believe what he saw. It appeared to be a family unit of incredibly large, ape-like creatures. They were heavily muscled, and thick hair covered most of their bodies. These were the Sasquatch mountain giants that the native guide had warned him about. There was four of them. A large male, who was close to eight feet tall, and a female, who was just over seven. There was also two smaller ones, also male and female, who were about six feet tall, which Osman reasoned were the offspring of the larger two. The creatures had no noticeable neck, flat faces, and a sloping brow that came to a slight peak at the tops of their heads. They also had wide, powerful jaws with large teeth. According to Ostman, the larger male's incisor teeth were quite pronounced in his mouth. None of the others had this feature, though. Their arms were very long in comparison to that of a human's, and the palms of their hands were quite large as well, but they had stubby fingers. Their feet resembled that of a human's, but they were enormous in size and the bottoms seemed to be heavily padded. Once Albert was able to gain his composure, he asked the Sasquatch what they wanted from him, but they did not answer, but instead continued to chatter and grunt amongst themselves. Ostman then began to look around to see where he was. He seemed to be in a small valley, around seven acres by his estimation. It was surrounded by sheer rock faces, and there appeared to be only one entrance 
and exit trail. After a short while, the Sasquatch creatures seemed to have lost interest in their new guest and wandered off. The large male then sat down by the only exit while the others went about their business. Albert knew that he could not get past the mail, so he tried to make the best of a bad situation. He collected his belongings and began to explore the enclosed area. Ostman was able to find a small source of water and some trees that he could camp under until he could devise his escape. He went through his things, and thankfully, everything was still intact. Most of his food was safe. He still had his gun, shells, knife, matches, a can of coffee, and his snuff. As Ostman was going through his things, he noticed that the young boy and girl were watching him curiously. They kept their distance, but were clearly interested in the man and his belongings. Ostman was just as interested in the Sasquatch as they were of him. He looked around the area and saw what he believed to be their bedding area. There was a small cave in the rock face, and the ground was covered in vegetation like a nest, and there seemed to be crude blankets that were made of moss, bark, and more vegetation. Ostman was actually quite impressed with this setup of what he originally thought were simple-minded, primitive creatures. Very little happened throughout the first day of captivity. The Sasquatch were keeping their distance, and Albert was doing the same. He made himself a cup of coffee and had a small meal before the sun finally went down and everyone went to sleep. The following day, the young boy seemed to be a bit more daring and wandered closer to Ostman's camp. He was clearly a very curious fellow, but did not seem aggressive at all. At one point, Osman rolled one of his empty cans towards the young boy, who excitedly took the item and showed it to the young girl. They played with it for a while, before they took it to the large male. They then seemed to have a discussion about the can, as they chattered and grunted back and forth for quite some time. By the third day, Ostman decided that it was time for him to leave. He was unsure exactly why the Sasquatch had abducted him in the first place. They mostly left him alone. They did not show him any aggression or try to eat him. Albert figured he could just pack up his things and stroll out without issue. So that's exactly what he attempted to do. However, there seemed to be an issue as soon as Albert reached the exit to the valley. The large male rushed to the exit and blocked Albert's path. The Sasquatch glared at him and began to push him back, making a noise that Osman described as sounding like Suka Suka. Albert backed off and considered drawing his rifle and shooting the creature, but he decided against it. He was unsure if his caliber of rifle was able to kill this thing or if it would just piss it off. Albert also only had six bullets left, and he did not think that would be enough to defend himself against all four of these creatures had they attacked. Albert then returned to his campsite in hopes of coming up with a better escape plan that would not include violence. Perhaps he could befriend the large female or the younger ones. If he were able to get on their good side, maybe they would take pity on him and let him go. But how could Ostman do that? They don't seem to understand English, and he did not understand their chattering. For now, it seems he was stuck. The next day, 
Ostman was able to see how this family unit of Sasquatch operated. The adults would take turns in search of food. They would leave the valley, then return a short time later, carrying grass, leaves, roots, nuts, and berries. The adults would then spend their spare time napping and resting. The children, on the other hand, would spend their time playing and having fun. According to Ostman, the young male would play a rather silly game, in which it would sit down on its butt. Then it would grab its feet in its hands, and then proceed to hop around on its backside. The young male was also quite the climber, and appeared to very much enjoy climbing trees and the rock faces that surrounded the valley. On the fourth day, the young male offered Ostman a meal of nuts, berries, and sweet roots, which he accepted. In return for this act of kindness, Ostman gave the young man one of his snuff boxes, which contained a small amount of the tobacco. The creature tasted the snuff, and seemed to like it very much. It then took the remainder to the older male, who also tasted the tobacco. The creatures then had another long discussion in their chattering language. After this, the older male seemed to become more interested in Albert, or more than likely, more interested in the tobacco that he possessed. The older male then spent the next few days slowly inching closer to Ostman as the younger boy started doing a few days earlier. Though Ostman had began to develop a more friendly relationship with the Sasquatch, he was becoming restless and wanted to leave. He did not want to cause these creatures any harm, but he reasoned if he could just incapacitate the older male, he would be able to escape. Thankfully, on the sixth day, that opportunity showed itself. That morning, Albert was able to get a fire going and started brewing some coffee while cooking his breakfast. The aroma of the caffeinated beverage gained the attention of the two males, who came in for a closer look. They sat down about ten feet away and watched Albert make his meal. Once his breakfast was finished, Ostman took out a new box of snuff and proceeded to fill his lip with tobacco. Then something unexpected happened. The large male reached out with its long and muscular arm, gesturing for the container of snuff. Albert then held the box in his hand, expecting the Sasquatch to take a small amount and chew it. But to his surprise, the large male snatched the entire box from his hand and emptied all of its contents into his mouth and then swallowed every bit of it. The reaction was almost instant. The Sasquatch began to scream and squeal. He rolled on the ground and clawed at his lips and tongue with his filthy fingernails. He then jumped to his feet and dashed towards the small water spring. The other three Sasquatch then rushed after him, in apparent concern for his well-being. Ostman knew this was his chance to escape. Not only because the exit was unguarded and the male was incapacitated, but he was also worried that the snuff would enrage the creature and that it was going to attack him. Albert took this opportunity to quickly pack what little supplies he had left and make a break for it. He held his rifle tightly in his hands as he ran towards the exit. He was fully prepared to shoot any of these creatures if he had to, and to hell with the consequences. It seemed that the younger Sasquatch took notice of his escape, and they began to shriek, which caused the older female to charge towards him. Ostman looked behind him and saw that the female was coming in fast, so he raised his rifle and fired around into the air. 
The crack of the rifle scared the female, and she turned back, running away. Ostman then loaded another shell into his rifle, and then hauled ass out of that valley. He ran for as long as he possibly could, constantly checking over his shoulder to make sure that another Sasquatch was not gaining on him. Albert ended up climbing a ridge so that he would be able to get his bearings and figure out where he was and how he could get back to civilization. He decided to rest atop this ridge for a few hours. He wasn't too worried about being abducted again. Since he had the high ground, he would be able to spot any Sasquatch coming in and fill it with lead if he had to. Once Ostman had caught his breath and knew which way to go, he set off to find a civilization. Unfortunately, there was no way he would be able to make it back before nightfall, and he was going to need to camp in the mountains once again. However, this time, he did feel somewhat safe. He felt as if he had put more than enough distance between himself and the Sasquatch, and that they would not be able to find him or harm him. Albert spent the next two days making his way out of the mountains, before he finally came into contact with other humans. He stumbled upon a crew of lumberjacks, who gave him food, water, and shelter, before taking him to safety. Ostman swore to never go prospecting in the mountains again. Following this terrifying ordeal, Ostman spent decades keeping this story under wraps. He had only spoken a word of it to a few very close friends and family members. He was afraid that if he made his story public, that no one would believe him, and he would be labeled a liar or a crazy person, and that he would be ridiculed and made fun of. He only decided to come forward with his story once he started seeing that the legend of Bigfoot had started to become more well-known by the general public. As the years passed by, major stories had broken about the mythical Sasquatch, such as the incident at Ape Canyon and the Jerry Crew construction encounter, which had given Bigfoot its iconic name. Albert knew this was the right time to finally make his story known. But of course, when these kinds of stories come forward, there is an avalanche of people who were quick to call the entire thing a fabrication. The first major point of contention regarding the Ostman encounter is the time frame in which Albert came forward. Skeptics believe that Ostman is nothing but a con man who saw the rise in Bigfoot popularity and whipped up this whole story in order to cash in on the Sasquatch craze. To skeptics, if this was indeed a real encounter, there would have been no legitimate reason why Ostman could not have come forward with that story when it happened. According to them, had Ostman told his story back in the 20s, he would not have gained nearly as much money or attention as he did in the late 50s, and early 60s. Also, renowned primatologist John Napier has said he is doubtful of the Ostman encounter. He believes that there is simply not enough food for apes of that size to sustain life in the area in which Ostman claims the encounter took place. But it should be noted that Ostman did say in an interview before his death that he did not believe the Toba Inlet was the permanent home of the Sasquatch. He believed that they were nomadic creatures that would travel from area to area, feeding on whatever food may be in season. Ostman was under the impression that the sweet grass and roots he saw the Sasquatch eating happened to be the food they were in that specific area for. 
But for the moment, let's all assume that the Ostman encounter is 100% true. If this is the case, why exactly did this family of Sasquatch want to abduct this man? After all, they supposedly held him captive for six days, and at no point did they harm him or try to eat him. The females did not attempt to mate with him, a la the movies Willow Creek or Night of the Demon. For the most part, the Sasquatch family barely paid attention to him during this entire encounter. Perhaps the older male who had abducted him was simply just a curious ape who figured, why not? From the story Ostman tells, it seems as if the older male Sasquatch had been aware of his presence on the mountain for several days before deciding to abduct him. What if the Sasquatch thought the sleeping bag was filled with more food and the abduction was accidental? Or is this how Sasquatch are made? Do they somehow turn civilized humans into feral ape monsters? I know that sounds far-fetched, but I'm just trying to think outside of the box here. But this also begs the question, what exactly happened to the other men who had gone missing in those mountains that the native guide mentioned to Albert beforehand? Do Sasquatch want human beings for some nefarious purposes? Or were their disappearances completely coincidental? Or maybe I am just putting too much thought into this. After all, if these creatures do exist, its intelligence would be far lower than that of a human's. The actions they take would not necessarily be based off of complex reasoning and motives. Sometimes animals just do things. I think the main piece of evidence that would verify the entire Ostman encounter would be the location in which he was held captive. As of right now, the valley has been lost, and no one has ever been able to locate it. But with our modern technology, such as drones, it might be worth scouring the Toba Inlet again. If these creatures were not nomadic, and this was their permanent home, we could very well find bones or other DNA evidence that could help prove the existence of Bigfoot once and for all. Hell, there might be the possibility that we find the descendants of the Sasquatch that held Ostman captive almost 100 years ago. But of course, there is the possibility that these big feet were nomadic. If that were the case, there would probably be no usable evidence left since so much time has passed. As for now, we simply have to accept that this story will remain a mystery. Albert Ostman died in 1975, but he swore that the story he recounted was the truth and he never wavered from it once. And if this story has taught us anything, it's that if you ever go camping near the Tolba Inlet in British Columbia, it would probably be a good idea to be armed and ready. From the sounds of it, there is at least a few mountain apes in that area that have a knack for making humans disappear. And Albert Ostman may have been the only man to escape their clutches and live to tell the tale. Well, campers, it appears that the fire is dying and the sun is rising. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. And I look forward to seeing you again next week around... The Lost Campfire. This episode 
was written and produced by me, McLean, Keeper of the Lost Campfire. Podcast artwork done by Kelly Bowen. You can find her on Instagram at kelsbells95.